And so we're going to be again in Matthew 6, verse 5 through 8. You can follow along with me uh, as, uh, as I read it. It says this. Jesus says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to understand it rightly, that we would be edified and transformed by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, have a, I have something to share with you that might mar, mar my reputation with you forever, uh, but I shared it with the East Campus, so I will share it with you as well. When I was in high school, I had a nickname, uh, and it was Pinky, and not Pinky, but actual Pinky. When I was, uh, when I was about uh, in eighth grade, I started uh, to spray paint my soccer cleats. I'd buy white cleats, and I would spray paint them hot, hot pink. I wanted to stand out and try out, and, uh, and it worked. Uh, it worked. I got to play at very high levels, but it kind of caught on, and then I began to, uh, f- I began to believe and think that my, my favorite color was pink, and so I would just say it was my, I think I believed it. I had a lot of trauma as a child, I'll just say this, like, so we won't get into the deep, dark places there, but uh, I, I became pinky, became part of my identity. Uh, I wore pink backpacks, pink shirts, pink shoes, uh, pink cell phone, pink earrings, everything I had was pink, and it, and it stuck. I, now listen, praise God for my wife who has cast those demons out of me, uh, and I am a brand new man. But the thing is, is this, I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be recognized. I wanted to stand out. And that is the heart of the issue that Jesus is dealing with here in the Pharisees and how they, how they practice their righteousness. It is they are aiming to be seen. And what we saw in the text last week is uh, their desire to be seen in their giving generously or giving generously to those who are in need. And now it is with prayer. And then next week we will talk a little bit more about prayer, but then also in fasting. If I were to sum up the text in a main point, it would be this, that your prayers do not need to be eloquent wordy or showy for the Father to hear you and reward you. I'll say it again, that your prayers do not need to be eloquent, wordy, or showy for the Father to hear you and reward you. So let's make our way through the text and let's see, let's see what we see. Verse 5 is where we'll start. It says this, and when you pray, remember he's coming off of uh, when you give to the needy, do it like this. And now he's saying, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward when you pray. So just like giving, just like, uh, just like what we'll see with um, uh, uh, fasting, prayer is an essential aspect to worship in the people of God. When you pray, now they actually had three hours, kind of ritualistic hours of prayer every day, the third, the sixth, and the ninth hour. And on those hours, the people would stop wherever they were, whatever they were doing, and they would pray. And so pr- public prayer is not actually the issue here because people would have prayed in public all of the time. If you happen to be at the market during the hour of prayer, you would stop and you would pray. But it was the motive behind the prayer that mattered. It says that they loved standing in the synagogues and in the street corners. Uh, the street corners here, the, the word is, it's the wide, it's the wide roads, not the narrow back streets. They want to be on the corner of the most populated streets. They wanted to be in the synagogue where all of the people were. They wanted to stand. They wanted to be seen. They wanted people to hear their pious prayers and to marvel at them. And he says that they get exactly the reward they want. People see them. People recognize them. But God does not. By the way, we shouldn't be so quick to judge. I think we're often guilty of praying, praying with other people in mind rather than just praying to 
the Father. You ever, you ever pray? By the way, I pray publicly every week. It's a battle that I have in my own heart. I think, ooh, that was good. That was like, those words were, that was a good alliteration, right? Our hearts are, are deceitful and they seek to corrupt us. You ever, you ever pray in public and, uh, and have in mind the idea to maybe, maybe impress or to say something eloquent? What will other people say? You ever been too embarrassed to pray in public? To pray to your father in public thinking, oh man, may, may I won't say the right words or people are going to think I'm not really spiritual or people, you're, you're too embarrassed to pray to your father because you're more consi- concerned about what those around you are saying. And like, God forbid you're at lunch or a meal with a pastor and he asks you to bless the food. The way you can avoid that is if you pay for the meal, he's obligated to pray. So that's just how that works, just so you know. And it's not for, it's just for Pastor Stephen's benefit. All right, I kid, I kid. But we shouldn't be too quick to jump to, uh, to judgment, whereas in our own hearts, uh, we, we will have these same temptations. He continues on. He says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret, he will reward you. Now, the common home uh, for the normal person, it wouldn't have had multiple rooms. It probably would have just been one big room or if there were other rooms, may, uh, it would have been like a little storeroom where you'd put your food or your perishables or maybe your, your valuable things. So he's saying, go into this little dark closet and shut the door. And you can see what he's doing. He's contrasting to the wide street corners and to the synagogues. He's saying, no, go to this, go to this little dark place. No one sees you in this place. No one sees you. And if they did see you in there, they would probably think you are weird. Why are you in the pantry? Like, what are you doing in there? And your father sees you in that quiet place. He sees you in the secret place. And those prayers that are lifted up and heard, they are rewarded by, by God. Again, Jesus is not establishing some prohibition against public prayer, but the intention of the heart. We would say this, though, that public prayer, your public prayer, should be preceded by private prayer. It's not a prohibition against public prayer, but it is saying uh, that, that that public prayer should be rooted in something deeper. In other words, if you only ever pray in public and you never pray in secret, then there's a problem there. The secret prayers are kind of a litmus test to your, the sincerity of your faith, or at least we would say the maturity of your faith. So brothers and sisters, and we are all guilty of this, we would say, compare and contrast your prayers in secret and your prayers in public. How often and what are your heart motives behind it? Verse 7, he says this, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. So if the first warning of prayer is about being showy, now the warning is about being just too wordy. It's this persistence, this this pointlessness, this repetition. Uh, The word alludes to like stuttering or stammering. You're just kind of going on and on and on, and there's not not really much purpose behind it. And he says, don't do this like the Gentiles do. That's what the Gentiles would do, is they would would ramble on and on and on to try to get the attention of their God, to make sure that their God could hear them and and, and know what it is that they they need. Uh, And so we actually see an example of this in 1 Kings. In 1 Kings, you think about Elijah, and the prophets. Uh, remember Elijah and the prophets, and they're trying to battle as whose God is the real God or whose God is the most powerful God. And so they set up this altar. And, uh, and so uh, I'll just read the text for you. Let's do that. Elijah said this to the prophets of Baal. He says, choose one of the bulls and prepare it. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. And so they took the bull given them and prepared it. And then they called on the name of Baal. From morning until noon, Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered, and they danced around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought, or he's busy, or maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and he must be awakened. And so they shouted louder, and they slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom until their blood flowed, midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. 
See, they're calling on their God. They have to get their God's attention. Maybe their God's distracted. Maybe their God's sleeping. I appreciated Elijah's uh, heckling of them. These are false gods. You can, you can uh, repeat all you want. And he's saying, don't, Jesus saying, don't pray like the Gentiles or the pagans pray. And by the way, we should not be too quick to judge. I think we often maybe would be guilty of having long-winded or uh, uh, long-winded or, or, or with the aim of eloquency rather than simplicity of praying to our Father. Now, I'm not knocking at all reverent prayer. We should certainly recognize who we are praying to. Um, but the Father wants to hear from you. And he is attentive, which is part of Jesus' point. I was thinking about this the other day. I was on a walk and I was thinking, what if my children talk to me in ways that I have found myself uh, talking to my heavenly father? I'll give you some examples. Uh, First is this, never. Just ever go through a season of prayerlessness? Just don't talk. If my children just didn't talk to me, rude. It's like, hey, we're in the same place. We live in the same house. I'm your dad. You just walk by. You just pretend like I'm not here. Or, or what, if, what if they only talk to me in public? There's three of my kids down here. I got a couple more somewhere in the room. Uh, only in public because they wanted to be seen by other people. They wanted people to think that we had a good relationship. When we're in the private places of our home, they would pay me no mind. But here we are in public and they would come to me and they would, and they would speak to me and they would speak reverently to me. Or what if when my children talked to me, they got all weird and informal, like a different person altogether? You guys know what I'm talking about. I don't want to call anybody out here because I don't know of anybody in the room, but you know the people that basically transform into a King James Version Bible when they pray? Like, Pata, we beseech thee this eve. You're like, Dude, you were just singing a Taylor Swift song. Like, this is, not, this is not who you are. This is not who you are. Well, what if my kids came to me and spoke to me just in long-winded, pointless ramblings, on and on and on, and you're like, you're like get, get to the point. Like, what are, I mean, they do that, actually. This is probably the one. This is probably the one that's like, yeah, they, could, they toe the line on this one. It's like, oh, what, do, what, do you, what do you need, kid? Uh, or what if they came only when they needed something? There was no relationship. There was no interaction. Just when they were in trouble, they would come to me, or just when they had need. You see, of course, we should be reverent. We should be respectful to our Heavenly Father. But we should not, we should not overlook the very uh, plain reality that it is God that chooses to use the language of Heavenly Father and children Why does he use language like that? It's because he's communicating the kind of relationship that he is intending to have with his children. That of a good father who loves his children and children who love and who respect and seek out their father. Verse 8, he says, do not be like them. Why? Why? For your father knows what you need when you ask them. The father not only sees you in the secret places. See, they're trying to get attention. They're trying to wake up their gods. They're rambling. There's repetitions. They're shouting. Are you awake? Do you hear me? Do you know what we need when you got to get your attention? But he says, your father, he not only sees you in the secret places, but he is omni-attentive. I just made that word up. It's not a real word. Omni-attentive. Our God is the God of omnis. That is, he is, he is fully these things. He has, uh, he has a, a, eternal insomnia. He never sleeps. He's always attentive. He's always aware, always alert to you. He is omniscient. That's a real word. All-knowing. He is omnipresent. That's a real word. He's, he's uh, at all places, at all times. He sees all things. Says your father in heaven, he doesn't even need you to tell him what you, he already knows in advance what you need before you even, before you even tell him. So he says, do not be like them. By the way, this is just a little bit of a side rant. 
I love that Jesus is teaching here in this section. He's doing two things. He's doing something that I think churches often don't, don't do. And that is he's saying, he's saying, don't do this thing. Don't be like these people, but be like this. I think oftentimes uh, our, our desire is to be so winsome that we only want to use positive language. We only want to frame things in positive language. Whereas Jesus is saying, don't be like the hypocrite that prays like this, which is a very direct, which is a very direct call out to those who are now going to be offended, but he's saying, instead, pray like this. This is what it should look like. This is what it should not look like, and this is what it should look like. Your father knows what you need even before you tell him. He already knows. This is a divine mystery. You know, we know uh, and believe that our God is sovereign. That is that he is, um, he is in control. He is all-powerful over all things. He is sovereign. He has a providential will, and yet in his sovereignty, he is still He is still moved by the prayers of his people. A sovereign God who is moved by the prayers of the people. Let me give you an example. In James 4, 2, he says this. You do not have because you do not ask. That's interesting. For a God that knows all things and sees all things, it is in all control and is working all things for the good of all, right? It is sovereign God. And yet there, is, there are things that could be, there are things you could have. We don't want to be just too materialistic on it. There are things that could come about that won't come about unless you pray for it. This at least speaks to the relational nature of God. He chooses it to be this way. He has created us. He loves us. We are his image bearers. He is a father who hears us and is moved by our prayers. Give some other scriptures on prayer just so we talk about, we think holistically about prayer, when we should pray, why we, why we should pray. A couple of examples. First of all, we're told that we should pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Pray without ceasing. In other words, the prayers are not just to be in the, in the quiet, uh, in the quiet uh, pantry, but uh, there's this constant disposition of prayer that the Father who sees all, who is in secret, who is omnipresent, he's with you all the times, he's in all circumstances, that through the rhythm of our life, uh, we can be in a constant state of prayer in conversation with God. We are to pray in faith according to God's will, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if, and if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that, uh, that we ha- have what we ask of him. That is that the Father knows that when we're praying according to his will, when we have need, when we cry out to the Father that he is a responsive Father. He answers our prayers. But we're also told to pray with right motives, James 4, 3. So this doesn't mean we just get whatever we want because we've asked the Father. He says this, you ask and you do not receive. Why? Because you ask wrongly to spin it on your passions. That is like our prayers going to our Father are not meant to be for our own just uh, prosperity prosperity and materialism, which unfortunately there's pretty, plenty of uh, strands of Christianity would say that. See, you have what you ask, just ask your heavenly father, you name it and you claim it. You pray in faith in the name of Jesus and you have it. You want that car, you want that job, you want that bank account, you get it. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about that your father hears you and according to his will, not that you would pray, not he's not a genie in a bottle. You just get whatever wish you want. You pray according to his will. You pray with right motives. And if you pray with wrong motives, it says here, you have not because you've asked wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Number four. Wait, I haven't been numbering. They're numbered on my paper, but you guys are like, where was number one, two, and three? (laughs) Philippians, pray when we're anxious, when we're anxious. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6. See, we go through life and we have a lot of worry. We have a lot of anxiety. We have things that stress us out. Uh, 
And he's saying that as you pray without ceasing, you're praying over these things, that your God who, who sees you even in the secret places, he knows, he knows the, uh, the feelings you have, the worries that you have. And what he wants you to know is that he is, he is the God who is all powerful. He is the God who sees all. He is the God who works all things out for good for those who love him and have called according to his purposes. So have faith and trust in him. And when you are anxious about things, it's because you don't have control. You are worried about the outcome. He wants you to have faith. He wants you to have trust in him through those circumstances, in all things, in all, all these situations, uh, uh, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known, be made known to God. We're told to pray over sin and sickness, James 5, 15 and 16, in the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, uh, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So people are sick or, or people are struggling with sin. This idea of confessing sin to one another and praying for one another in the midst of these things. There's just an endless amount of things that we ought to be prayed for. And all these circumstances lift all of these things to God continually. Now, I don't want to, over pat, I don't want to overlook a, a word. It says this, that when we pray in this way, when we have a right prayer po- po- posture, that we are rewarded for our prayer. I think that's a strange word for me. I mean, Jesus used it. He can use whatever word he wants. But I'm saying, as I'm processing the words Jesus used, I'm thinking, I don't think of prayer as something that I get to be rewarded from rewarded from. I could see it like giving. You give to the needy and you're kind of rewarded. But prayer, that's an interesting concept. Well, what is the reward for right praying? Well, number one, I think a reward is, is simply answered prayer. Just answered prayer. Your father has heard you and he has responded. That is in and of itself a reward. But I think there's actually a greater reward hidden right here in our text in plain sight. It says that your father who sees in secret He is your father who sees in secret. But before that, it says, your father is also the one who is in secret. Your father is in secret. I think the greatest reward that you and I receive in prayer is the very presence of God himself. See, it's the greatest reward that we have. Well, not only because it's the greatest treasure that we could have is, is, is the presence of God with us, but it's actually is the greatest reward because it's the greatest need we have. See, from the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, image bearers, uh, uh, in his own image, male and female, when they sinned, there was a separation from the presence of God. God was walking with them. He was in the garden. He was communing with them. He was talking with them. And then sin separated all that. And they were cast out from the garden. And the whole meta of scripture, the whole, the whole from Genesis all the way through to Revelation is this progressive movement of the presence of God coming back or being restored back to those that he loves, that he's created, those that have been separated. When we see in the time of Abraham, uh, uh, we see uh, that God is the God who... Um, who goes before the people, who goes before the people. And then when Moses comes, you see that, but also then you see that God then comes and he is in the midst of people now dwelling in the temple, but there's a veil and there's a separation from the presence of God and the temple and the holy and holies, which is eventually built. But then you have Jesus come and who is he? He is God with us. Now the presence of God in the flesh, uh, by, by way of God the Son and in the incarnation, he is with us, and then he dies for our sins, uh, and, and he, he, he is buried, and he's resurrected from the dead. He ascends into heaven, and he sends the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit now, for those that have faith in Jesus Christ, it is God within us, the presence of God within us. And this, this plan, this plan of salvation and redemption and the presence of God being restored back to us was God's plans even before the foundations of the world. It was not a knee-jerk reaction from Adam and Eve. They fell and God's scrambling and he's figuring out, oh man, I, gotta, I, I need to find a way to re- redeem these people. No, actually before the foundations of the world, the Lord knew and established this. And we see this in Ephesians 3 or Ephesians 1, 3 through 10. Follow along with me. It says this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. 
In him we have redemption through the blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the, rich, the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purposes, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. See, this plan of redemption the presence of God being restored back to a fallen people. It was a plan that was actually established before the foundations of the world even happened, prior to God even creating all things, that God would draw near to you, to you in this place right now, the presence of God accessible, the presence of God here. You know, as the people of God, we are, we are called and referred to as the temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit, whereas the Holy Spirit is indwelling us. And as we come, this is why the Sunday gathering is so precious. It's so spiritual. It's so necessary to our spiritual growth and development and our edification. Because as we are together, as we're fellowshipping and as we are praying and we're serving one another and we're sitting under the teaching of God's word, it is the spirit of God and the people of God we are being ministered to. We are being built up. It is so important. And so the, as I wrap up, the thing that I would say here would be this, is for those of you that are sitting in the room that are brothers and sisters in Christ, we can't overstate the significance of what it means to be the people of God with the spirit of God, the presence of God indwelling us, filling us. And as we are united, he is glorified and we are transformed. But for the person sitting in the room that is not yet put their faith in Jesus Christ, repented of their sins, believed upon him. The call would be, would be join us, be separated from God no more. Be separated from the presence of God no more. Turn from your sins, turn back to your creator, your father in heaven who desires to hear from you. He sees, he sees you, he sees your life, he sees your struggles, he sees your pains, he sees your hurt. And all of these things have uh, ultimately in his sovereign hand, they have purpose, they have meaning. He will work them out. He will orchestrate them. But we don't want to misunderstand the scriptures that God works all things for good, not for all people, but for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. That's what the scriptures say. So we would say, turn your heart to God, love him, believe upon Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, be baptized, belong to the people of God, be filled with the spirit of God and join us as we seek to work worship him and live out our life on mission that we seek to be countercultural and proclaim the gospel to those who are desperately in need of it. What we are doing here, brothers and sisters, as the people of God, it's so much more than just, oh, cultural Christianity or, oh, I just, I want to, I just want to have the best life that I can have and live at peace. No, it is, there's a spiritual war going on and the, the, and the, and the God of heaven has redeemed us and called us out of the kingdom of darkness to belong to the kingdom of light that we would be, as we've seen Jesus already talk about, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the city on a hill. And you know how we best magnify that? You know, best display that? By being close to the presence of God. So I would end up saying this, and I speak to myself, every text that I work through, and I know this is true for Pastor Stephen, especially for Pastor Stephen, I feel like every text he preaches on is like his new favorite text. And uh, I love that about him. But the text is doing a work on us. It should be doing a work on us before it's doing a work on you. That we would be a people of prayer. That we would be a people of prayer. And that our prayer postures would be right. We'd be praying in the secret places. We'd be praying with one another as we're sick or as we're struggling with sin. But that we would draw near to God. And we know that this text, the scriptures say, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Let's draw near to God as his people this morning. Father, we draw near to you in this place. And many of us are like children who don't talk to our father or, um, or, or, or get, we use weird language or uh, help, us, help us to see rightly what you intend, what you have intended. You are our father. You are our father and you desire a relationship. You want to hear from us. We don't need elegant words, wordy prayers, you want us to talk to you. And so forgive us, Lord, where we haven't done that, where we've neglected that, where we've, we've been silent in our relationship with you, or we've only come to you and we need things. Teach us. We need to be taught. And we know as we continue in the text, Lord, by your grace, you're going to show us. Jesus will say, this is how you pray. We're eager to learn. We want to, uh, we want to have a right relationship with you. And to have right relationship, we need right communication. So we have your word to us. 
And now, God, help us as this week, in this week, as we study your word, as we come back together next week uh, to talk through, uh, help us to know how do we pray to you, not just the disposition of our hearts, but specifically maybe the kinds of things we should say. We love you, Lord. We thank you for salvation that we have and share in Jesus Christ. Thank you that we are your people here, set apart for your purposes, and may we bring you glory in the way we live that out. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Uh, Amen.